we must be live. So um, apologies, everybody. I noticed there are a lot of chat about uh, did the webinar end, so uh, uh, a little technical difficulties. Anyway, um, so let me introduce my myself. Uh, I'm Timothy Cho. I'm um, going to do the webinar today and uh, introduce you to some of the, I think, very interesting concepts um, and uh, solutions around the so-called Internet of Things. So um, let me let me start by um, giving you a little bit more background uh, on myself. I usually ask my um, young companies. I do a lot of work in, with startups to kind of introduce themselves. And so um, the very first thing is um, I actually uh, came to Silicon Valley a little bit over 35 years ago to work for one of the original Kleiner Perkins startups, uh, Tandem Computers. We actually built nonstop fault-tolerant multiprocessors. And um, so I've had a career in, in the startup world, some startups that you've uh, heard of. And uh, I, I was actually early uh, as an advisor to WebEx, and, um, and some you have not heard of. These days, um, because of my interest in this uh, industrial Internet of Things space, enterprise Internet of Things space, I um, uh, am, became the uh, chairman of the Alchemist Accelerator and am spending personal investment time in, uh, in a number of ventures. So there's a whole aspect of my career which has been with startups. The other is uh, I've been involved with large corporations. I um, Basically, my last full-time job I spent as the uh, president of Oracle On Demand, which was the very early days of the um, cloud business at Oracle, which today is a little bit over $2 billion uh, worth of business. And the last thing is um, I've had the good fortune of teaching at Stanford for now, you know, a little bit over 30 years. In the old days, I used to teach uh, introductory computer architecture. And about 10 years ago, I started up a class on... Um, cloud computing, which I do the first and last lecture, and in between I have guest lectures. If you're at all interested, uh, type in cs309a.stanford.edu, and you can learn a little bit more about that class. Um, anyway, um, all these things have come together into me starting to think a lot about the question, which was, well, what was next for enterprise software? So per my comments, I've spent time in the world where, you know, we were building whatever, CRM, ERP, et cetera, applications uh, delivered on premises. And um, over time, we all know these applications were also delivered as cloud services. But in essence, the features were pretty much the same. And so part of me has been asking the question, well, well in essence, what's next? Is, is that all there is? Um, as I indicated, I teach this class at Stanford. I actually had Paul Moritz, who uh, at the time was CEO at VMware, uh, do one of my classes. And uh, at the, one of his people ended up um, going to the early days of GE. And I got an email and said, oh, would you like Bill Rue to come and do your class? And I said, well, I'd heard a story that you guys, GE was working on things in this uh, space, but I was like, yeah, I didn't really know much. So I um, went over to visit, and I always like to say, well, I thought I was going to hear a marketing pitch about industrial Internet, and instead I, my eyes were open, really, on the subject of this whole, uh, what people will call industrial Internet of Things or enterprise Internet of Things. And so about two or three years ago, I decided I really need to understand more about it. I, as many of you may think, um, the world of IoT, at least for me at that point in time, was, well, Nest thermostats and Fitbits and, you know, consumer questions. And I, I was sitting there going, well, I really don't know why my coffee maker should talk to my toaster. Um, but I rapidly started to understand this is not really just about the consumer side, although certainly there's interesting things happening there. But there's this huge opportunity on the uh, industrial or enterprise side. Uh, and so I ended up um, authoring a book, which we will go through today in very broad 
brushes, which identifies a framework. We'll talk about what those, um, what those things or machines are, how they're connected, what do you do to collect data from them, what can you learn from that, and finally, what would you do differently. And then the book goes through 15 different case studies. We'll talk about some of these as we go through this. Um, obviously, the book is far more detailed in this area. So um, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do really three things with you. One is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, technology, uh, a little about where we are today and where I think we're headed. Uh, obviously, since I'm in Silicon Valley, uh, I'm spending a lot of time with young startups in this area, and so you'll hear a little bit of that about what I'm going to argue as next generation technologies. Uh, the second part is we'll talk about, well, technology is cool, but what does this mean? Why does it matter? We'll talk about how it matters to companies that build machines, so build tractors, build wind turbines, build blood analyzers. And then the second part, what does it mean to people who use machines at the hospital, a farm, a railroad, et cetera? And then the last part, and, you know, I, I just – uh, came back from Vietnam. We launched the book actually in Vietnam about three uh, three weeks ago, and uh, I really want to spend a little time talking about why this technology might change a country, but also actually might change the world. And so that's where we'll end. So um, hopefully this will be an interesting uh, half hour, forty five minutes for you. Uh, I always like to say, well. Uh, hopefully you'll learn a few lessons for long life in your career, um, but uh, I'm going to start with outlining uh, some of the lessons for long life in your personal life. So this is actually a um, series of uh, um, uh, 10 lessons for long life in your personal life, uh, and I'm waiting for the screen to refresh here. So 10 Lessons for Long Life in Your Personal Life, um, which is actually taken from a temple in Kyoto, Japan. Maybe since it feels like I'm not, I don't have control of it right now. So if the, um, the, uh, the uh, show operators can do it, maybe you can advance the slide as I'm talking. So um, 10 Lessons for Long Life in Your, um, in your Personal Life taken from a temple in Kyoto, Japan. It's believed to be over 500 years old, and it indeed contains the 10 secrets to long life. Um, I ended up having this translated, so if you could uh, go to the next slide and uh, show, me, uh, show me that, uh, you'll see here that it says, you know, you're supposed to eat more vegetables and less meat, and I know I'm talking to a largely Indian population, so that may not be news to you. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, have more sleep and less worry, more actions and less words. And then the one I've always found amusing, uh, which is more bathing and less clothing. And, uh, you know, maybe if you're a Buddhist monk 500 years ago, there wasn't much interesting to do, so this was the most amusing thing to do. Uh, so with that, I'm going to jump into talking about, and hopefully you guys are seeing the slides advancing. I, uh, I seem to not have control of that right now. So um, uh, talk a little bit about technology is the first thing. So uh, one of the things I'll say to you is that pretty much, um, oh, I now remember what the slides look like, so I'll drop back just one second. Uh, I know the next two slides end up talking about, um, or actually a report that the World Economic Forum released um, a couple years, about a year or two ago. And basically it says that, well, the first thing that you, uh, the, that we've really worked on that the internet has affected has really been financial services, retail, right, those areas. Uh, and, and media, and, and that's really kind of the hub of what we've done today. But the next big giant thing to happen, and they write that in the next 10 years, the Internet of Things uh, will affect you know, agriculture, power, water, health care, all these major industries, and that represents actually two-thirds 
of the global GDP, two-thirds of the global GDP. I mean, this is the vast portion of the, uh, of the, of the global economy. Um, so with that, and I'm still wondering if we're seeing the slides advancing, since every time I hit the mouse, nothing's happening. So I'll try again. Just do a refresh. Um, but I'll, I'll jump in, keep going. It is, and I, I made this comment when I started this, that most of the technology that we have built up until now has largely been for the Internet of People. So what do I mean by that? Well, most of the applications that I'm particularly focused around, enterprise applications, have been kind of like CRM applications or purchasing or ERP or any of these sorts of things really has affected, oh, good, that looks good. Uh, so what is the Internet of Things? Uh, let me go next slide. Let's see if it shows the Internet of People. Yes, good. So CRM applications, e-commerce applications, right, search, all these things fundamentally believe that the thing that uh, we're talking to is a human, right? So at the end of the day, I, I sit there and go, well, uh, and I say, well, Stanford kids spend a lot of money to hear the next sentence. I go, uh, you know, people are, are not things, right? People are not things. Things are not people. And I'm going to give you five reasons why things are not people. So the first is there are going to be way more things connected to the Internet than there are people. Um, if you listen to John Chambers' speech, he will talk about 500 billion things connected to the Internet. Well, that's literally 100 times the global population. Uh, I spent some time with a large health care provider in the United States, and they'll say, oh, yeah, this already happened. We have way more things, way more machines connected than we do people, okay? Number two, things can be where people are not. Things can be in your stomach in a smart pill. Things can be a mile underground in a coal mine. Things can be out in the middle of the Australian outback, right? So things can be where people are not. Third, things have more to say than people. Uh, Modern-day wind turbines actually have 500 sensors on them. Now, think about how much data is coming out of those things. That's way more than what I could ever type as a human or click as a mouse, right? So things have way more to say than people do. Fourth, things can say this much more frequently. There's a machine in the coal mining industry which uh, is called a long wall shear. It basically is a several football fields long, 30 meters high. It digs its way through a coal seam, and as it digs through the coal seam, basically a roof or a, what they call an artificial roof is formed. One of the things that happens um, is that every once in a while this roof will collapse onto the machine. When this happens, they have to go dig out their $100 million machine, right? So they end up putting vibration sensors on top of this roof to be able to predict roof failure. Those uh, sensors run at 10,000 cycles per second, 10,000, which is way faster than any human could ever type, right? And the last one, and I like, it's fun to debate, well, you know, things can be programmed, people can't. So fundamentally, right, if you understand that things are not people, then why would the technology built for the Internet of People work for the Internet of Things, right? And so this is why I look at it and go, there's an enormous opportunity in front of us because of this discontinuity to build entirely new software, entirely new technology companies that are focused on the Internet of Things, not the Internet of People. So we're going to touch each of these areas. I want to talk about the things themselves. Again, kind of where they are today, where we're headed in the future. How do you connect these things? What do you do to collect data from them? What can you learn from that? And finally, what would you do differently? 
Now, I make a point that in the world of Internet of People applications, we had to build applications that did something, you know, let you buy a book or, you know, finish a purchase order so that we would have data for you to learn, right? I mean, analytics followed the application. But I'll go, you know, you don't have to entice a wind turbine to talk to you. You just turn it on. It'll talk all day and all night. So we actually have the opportunity to learn, you know, before we do something. Okay? So let's start walking through this. And, you know, one of the things you should think about is that what is really – kind of kick this whole thing off is the advent of low-cost sensor technology driven by cell phones. So I know every one of you in the audience, you're holding a cell phone. If you pull it out of your pocket and look at it, what you, you actually are looking at is you've got a machine which has 12 sensors on it, you know, magnetometers, accelerometers, right? um, barometers, um, and by the way, there is a cell phone in Japan which has a radiometer on it for fairly obvious reasons, right? So if you think about it, I've got 12 sensors connected to a very powerful computer uh, with a lot of storage, a lot of memory, and then connected to three different networks, right? And if you took the fancy case off of it and the fancy display, that computer you're staring at is probably about 50 bucks, right? So one of the things you might ought to think about, and I've been thinking about, is, well, okay, uh, what happens or why or when will we see a cell phone inside each of our machines, right? And, and so whether that's a gene sequencer, which is what you're looking at there, or a tractor or, or an uh, air compressor, right, when will we see a cell phone inside each one of these. Now, I said um, I was speculating on this. Well, I actually teach a class at Tsinghua University in Beijing, and, uh, and uh, by virtue of that, I show up in Beijing once a year, and so I sometimes meet with, my, um, with my, uh, some of my former students. One of them is an uh, engineer at uh, Xiaomi. Some of you may know who Xiaomi is. They're actually uh, the world's largest producer of cell phones. They make 80 million cell phones a year. Um, interestingly enough, they're starting to saturate the Chinese market, so they're starting to look at India, right? But the other thing they're starting to do is look at building totally new products. And so I said, well, like, give me an example. And he said, well, uh, let me show you, and this is a quintessentially uh, Chinese product it's an air purifier. So if you know anything about uh, China's big cities, uh, the air quality is pretty bad. So building an air purifier is a pretty good, pretty good product idea. Now, if you open up that air purifier, guess what you see inside? And I'll tell you, it's basically a cell phone. And this is not too hard to believe because the vice president of engineering at Xiaomi is actually – um, the, one of the original Android uh, guys, so uh, as I said, not too unobvious how this idea happened. So you could say, well, do you think that inside these machines of the future you'll see an Android operating system? Maybe. Will it be Microsoft? I don't know. I could tell you that another point of view says, well, all of those operating systems were built for the Internet of People. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity to build an entirely new operating system for the Internet of Things, and maybe one which from the very beginning is engineered for security, because if you look at what most of these machines look like today, it's a fairly primitive hardware and software environment, and as we move forward, uh, we have the opportunity to engineer something, I think, completely different than where we came at it from the Internet of People. So um, let's move from the things themselves to talking about how to uh, connect those things, right? Um, so today, for the Internet of People, we're all pretty happy if I've got Wi-Fi and 3G, 4G, et cetera, right? Um, but 
let me tell you that um, in, when you look at uh, things, that is probably not going to be adequate enough. And let me give you an example. So there's a company in the UK called Sensium Vitals. They actually build what's called a vital sign. It's a vital sign monitoring patch. So it monitors uh, your uh, respiration, heart rate, et cetera. So when you come into the emergency room, they slap one on you. Now, the design criteria that they established was they did not want to use rechargeable battery packs for this thing because they would have to wash it and, by the way, go through the recharge cycle. So they said, we want to build a patch that uses disposable batteries. Well, as soon as they use disposable batteries, um, there, there's no way to run Wi-Fi. They don't have the power to run Wi-Fi. So they ended up moving to a Zigbee mesh-based network. Um, so I believe that in the Internet of Things, we're going to see a diversity of communication technologies, connection technologies, diverse by range, diverse by data rates, and diverse by power requirements. You're seeing stuff at one end of the spectrum. Some of you may have heard of LoRa, Thickfox. Uh, I'm actually working with a company that's doing what I would call a next generation of RFID. So low data rate, low power requirements, all the way up to, and I go, well, so what is the most demanding networking application out there, well, probably um, I'll go a toss-up between the World Cup, the finals of the World Cup, and Victoria's Secret's one runway model show, right? So, you know, this is a ton of content sitting in the cloud being pushed out uh, into the endpoints. Now, let's look at the Internet of Things. Um, a large wind turbine manufacturer out there owns 15,000 wind turbines. Well. These wind turbines generate data from 500 sensors once a second. So there's a tremendous amount of data coming out from the endpoints back up into the cloud. So we may have to end up building reverse streaming networks, much higher performance networks than what we're doing today. And I'm actually spending time in the 60, 70, 80 gig regions millimeter wave, right, this next generation, much higher performance networks, okay? So connection, right? We're, uh, as I said, I think we're going to see a much more diverse set of connection technologies. Now, once I connect, then the next thing is, well, how am I going to collect the data from these things? Well, today's technology is, as you would guess, People are using, you know, SQL uh, to go collect some of this data. But I think something more important is starting to happen, which is um, I was spending time with a large um, oil and gas company. Uh, they have an oil drilling rig off of the Gulf of Mexico. This oil drilling rig has 40,000 sensors on it, 40,000 sensors. And you go, I was, like, enormously curious, like, what are you guys doing with all this data? And they go, well, most of it's digital exhaust, digital exhaust. What does that mean? It's just going up in the air. They're not doing anything with it, right? Why is that? Well, if you think about it, you go, well, um, if I'm going to take all that data and store it in the conventional ways, right, of doing this, I'm going to either send a uh, salesman for a large disk uh, drive manufacturer to, to uh, his uh, first cabin, to his, you know, uh, successful sales guy club, or I'm going to send the guy who writes uh, SQL database software uh, to club. Uh, and even if I was to come up with a configuration that would store this data, and, you know, and let's assume that it costs $10 million to buy such a thing, I walk into my boss and she'll say, well, what are you going to do with the data? And, and that's really the interesting question because today most of the technology has been built, has been for the Internet of people. So these BI tools, visualization tools, Excel, et cetera, we're all architected to deal with data from the Internet of people. Now think about, back to my little example of the wind turbines, what if I have barometric pressure at 15,000 different wind turbines every second. What intuition could a human possibly have about this? And so I think the opportunity exists. 
<laughs> for those of you who spend any time in the world of machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, to basically bring some of these technologies which have seen such remarkable advancements on the uh, consumer side into the world of the Internet of Things. I'll just take a couple of seconds out to talk about the, the change, and I, some of you are probably already starting to be interested in this, but the dramatic improvements in, and if you've played with Alexa, which is a great speech recognition system, you've noticed, you know, Facebook's facial recognition or Google Translate, kind of like, well, why is this stuff happening so rapidly um, and with such high quality? And, and just to put a marker on it, uh, many of you may know there's a competition referred to as the ImageNet competition. And the ImageNet competition uh, is one where you compete the human against the computer to recognize images. When it was launched in 2011, the, uh, the uh, humans uh, were doing about 95% correct in, in identifying an image. And computers, I think, were at 72% correct, right? The so humans, 95%. Computers at 72. Two years ago, the computers hit 96%. So the computers were actually more accurate than the humans. And uh, I was just reading that uh, they're basically saying this is the last year of the ImageNet competition because it's basically not a competition anymore, right? So why, why is this happening? And I'll point out three essential ideas. The first is the advent of tons of technology, some of this is coming, it's been around for quite some time uh, in neural networks, deep learning, these sorts of areas, now starting to arrive as open source in one form or another. And, and uh, so, so number one, that, software technology. Number two, a crap load of compute horsepower for no money. So I made a comment, I started teaching class at Tsinghua University about seven years ago. When I first went, uh, the guys at Amazon gave me $3,000 worth of computer time. So I showed up in class at $3,000. Well, that's worth, uh, you could buy a computer in Northern California, Virginia, or Ireland for three and a half years. So most of the students looked at me and went, yeah, so what, right? And um, so I said, or, $3,000 buys you uh, a uh, 10,000 computers for 30 minutes. $3,000 buys you 10,000 computers for 30 minutes. What would you do with that, which is what I wanted to think about? Well, I think we now know the answer to that question, which is a ton of computer horsepower for no money is the second major linchpin. And the third is uh, the advent of large quantities of data. So why is Facebook facial recognition so good? Well, they have a ton of faces. Why did AlphaGo, some of you may be familiar with the idea that, you know, uh, thinking that a computer could be could beat a human in Go was probably 10, 20 years away, but yet this already happened like a year and a half ago, right? Well, by the way, they had one million, right, Go games that they were analyzing. So I'm going to move, I saw it um, um, jump to enterprises to build machines, that's okay. Uh, I, the last part of the stack, so to speak, is the do, which is really the applications. We could talk a little about middleware and, and uh, next generation applications for things, but we'll skip and say, I, I really want to now move to, okay, that was a lot of cool technology conversation. Okay, let's go to the next step, which is why would anybody care, right? So I'm going to split this conversation between uh, why would enterprises that build machines care, right? Build uh, combine harvesters, build forklifts, build build machines, and the second group is why would people who use machines care, right? Why would a hospital care? Why would a railroad care, et cetera? Okay, so let's start with enterprises that build machines. Well, fairly obviously, right? And this is for those of you who've never seen a combine harvester, this is a combine harvester, right? A combine harvester uh, harvests grain. Um, and by the way, if you're a gra if you harvest grain, wheat, right, corn, etc., this is not done all year round. This is done only in a segment in time. 
And so if you're going to go do this, uh, you, you really want to be able to go out there, harvest the grain, and get back in before it starts to rain. So the availability of that machine, the reliability of that machine is very important in this window of time. So if I can use data to make sure that that machine runs well, is more highly available, is higher quality, hey, that's good for me as the guy that makes the machine. Right? Um, let's go to the next thing, which is people will say, hey, that's really good. Uh, the other reason why you want to uh, learn from your machines is to reduce the cost of service. Um, there's actually a company in the United States called United Rentals. They, uh, they rent construction equipment, forklifts, um, scissor lifts, generators, et cetera. Uh, they do about $6 billion of revenue a year. Um, interestingly enough, they spend about $1 billion a year maintaining all of that equipment. I mean, this is literally 4,000 different types of construction equipment, right? Um, so if they could use technology to at all change the maintenance schedule so that it is effective, but they don't spend, they only save, let's pretend they only save 10% of that of that maintenance budget. Well, that's $100 million that goes all the way to the bottom line, right? So the classic answers to the question, why would I do this, are one, you'll produce a more reliable product. The second is, uh, you'll be able to reduce the cost of service. But, but I actually think something more important is going on here, and it's because once you start thinking about the future of machines themselves, right? So I like to say, what is the machine of the future? It's a bunch of sensors, a bunch of actuators, a big computer in the middle, a lot of software. That's the machine of the future. And if you want to go see one today, and I don't do a lot of consumer examples, I like to say, go go look at a Tesla. That's what a Tesla is, right? Uh, you actually get new features on it every month. I mean, who ever imagined a car having new features, right? So that that but it, this is not limited just to like you know Tesla. Um, you probably don't realize this, um, but but. Um, but the modern day uh, Panamera, Porsche Panamera, um, they, uh, they uh, uh, 2016 had two million lines of code in it, two million lines of code. Uh, the 2017, which is a brand new model year, has 100 million lines of software in it. Uh, modern day healthcare machines, an MRI scanner, actually has almost 10 million lines of software in it. So the observation question is, well, at the end of the day, right, if, a, uh, if these machines are increasingly becoming software defined, then wouldn't it stand to reason that the business models that we've seen for the world of software would not also apply to the world of machines? And so I want to take you through three business models which have dominated the world of software and talk about it, both on the, from the software perspective and then also from the perspective of machines. So we'll start with the very first business model, which is a model which says I've got products and service, product and service. So uh, I made the comment early on, I started, uh, I, Worked at Tandem. I worked at Tandem. Worked at Oracle for a number of years. If you looked at Oracle's business model, uh, and I'll point out right before they bought Sun, so it's purely a software company. What you would have seen is a company that did 15 billion dollars in revenue. Three billion of it was for new product, new ERP, CRM, right, this sort of thing, uh, database product. 12 billion dollars of that revenue was actually service revenue, which is recurring revenue, and by the way, very high margin revenue, uh, because at the end of the day, service is actually an information transfer business, and I can use a ton of technology to do that, so I can create very high margin businesses, recurring revenue, okay? So this actually, if you're a student of the software industry, uh, 
this is what we've done for a lot of years. This, is, this business model is well understood. Okay, let's flip over to the world of machines, right? So if you look at the world of machines, you may wonder to yourself, why is GE, General Electric, spending so much time and effort talking about the industrial Internet, uh, et cetera? Here in the United States, they run ads on Saturday Night Live, which is a late-night television show, just to advertise for software engineers. So why does a company which builds jet engines, MRI scanners, wind turbines, et cetera, why are they investing in this? Right? So I tell people, all you need to do is go to, the, uh, to their 10K, which is a publication that every public company creates um, and for 2016, and open up to the third page, and you'll see the answer to this question which is they did $110 billion in revenue last year in 2016. 50%, $55 billion of that was service revenue. It was not selling you a new jet engine, a new MRI scanner. It was service on that. And remember I made the point, this is recurring revenue. In their case, they often sign multi-year contracts. So they actually, from an accounting point of view, tell you they have over $250 billion of revenue in backlog because these are multi-year contracts, right? And made a point, also high margin. So if you, if you think about it from a business perspective, if I could grow my service revenue, not only am I going to end up with more, more revenue, but I'm going to end up with recurring revenue and much higher margin than just selling you the jet engine. Okay? So products and services, that's model one. The second model is, and we did this in the software business, we said, okay, I'm going to take um, uh, your, your machine, I'm going to connect to it. And if I can connect to your machine, then I can provide you advice. I can say, hey, speed up, you know, uh, uh, put this security patch in, uh, reconfigure this disk, it'll be higher performance. So I can provide you what I like to call assisted services. We actually built an early version of this at Oracle, generate over 300 million revenue, right, of providing assisted services. So that's the world of software. Let's go to the world of machines. Uh, there's a company out there, in fact, there's a case study in the book uh, called New York Airbrake. New York Airbrake um, builds um, uh, a application which connects to locomotives collects data from those locomotives, uh, and then provides advice to the locomotive operator as to whether to speed up here or slow down there, save fuel cost. Uh, Norfolk Southern, a big U.S. railroad operator, they save $6 million a year in fuel costs by using this. So that leads you to the last point of view, which is, well, if I can tell you what to do, well, I can do it for you. And so actually, and this is a photo of that, uh, Rio Tinto, a big mining company in, in operating in Australia, is going to run an autonomous train from the north of Australia to Perth uh, entirely, uh, entirely automated, no, no human in the way, right? Now, we, we in the world of software say, hey, you know, we've been doing that, uh, you know, rather than let uh, the the client figure out when to um, uh, uh, change a security patch or reconfigure a disk, we say, well, we'll do it for you. And that we have called software as a service. So the logical third step of this model, the third business model is what I like to call machines as a service, right? So this is actually um, a air compressor company you can buy the air compressor, you can buy a service contract against the air compressor, you can connect to the air compressor and get an assisted service, or you can actually get compressed air as a service. Uh, I don't do a lot of consumer examples, but there's a company in Brazil right now where you don't have to buy tires for your car. You just go to, go to them, they put brand new tires on your car and you drive away. And they charge you per mile that you drive, that you drove. So the advent of a machine as a service model is hugely disruptive. Uh, 
And uh, as we are already seeing, I'll say, in my world, in the world of software, in the world of hardware, is people that move to these business models have enormously different uh, advantages in being able to do this. So uh, my counsel to people that buy, build machines is I go, you don't want to be, you don't want to be second into doing this. Okay, so talked about why this technology matters to people who make machines, right? Okay, let's go to the second part, uh, which is, well, why does this matter to people who use machines, right? So uh, I'm going to take you through four different reasons why it matters, um, and we'll start with um, if uh, m there are many businesses out there where their cost structures, their operating costs, are driven by their consumables cost. Um, so the one that you may be familiar with is the airline industry. So the airline, uh, uh, if I run an airline, uh, my my margins, my operating costs are heavily driven by fuel cost. So if I can operate my airline much more precisely, then I can save fuel cost and, and operate with much higher margins. Now, um, you, we're aware of that one. The one you're probably not aware of is gene sequencing. In the world of gene sequencing, the so-called $1,000 gene sequence, $767 of that gene sequence is actually chemical reagents or consumables cost. So we're going to reduce the cost to do gene sequencing. We have to reduce how much of a consumables that we use. Okay, so operating more precisely will reduce consumables cost. Second, um, I can operate in a much more reliable fashion. This is actually a story in the book about the largest um, electrical utility company in the United States, uh, Duke Energy. They actually put in place a group of what are called synchrophasers or PMMUs. These are machines that measure the phase angle on the grid. Um, these, just to make another point, these things operate at uh, 60 hertz, 60 times per second. They sample this data. And why are they doing this? Well, they're amassing the data together to learn from it, to learn whether they can predict a blackout. And so obviously if they can predict a blackout, they can operate much more reliably. Third, uh, I can create higher quality products. Now in the world of agriculture, the world of farming, um, well, if I use less herbicides and less pesticides, that's good because that's lower consumables cost. But, oh, by the way, I'm using less herbicides and less pesticides. I'm creating a healthier product, right? And then last, fourth, I can create safer systems, right? Uh, I said I started out my career at Tandem Computers. We built nonstop fault-tolerant machines. We used to have a joke, how do you build a reliable computer system? Well, you get a man and a dog. You go, really, a man and a dog? You say, yeah. Well, the man's to feed the dog, the dog's to keep the man away from the computer. Because if you're a student of any of this, you know that the number one reason why computer systems fail is human error. And if I can take humans out of the loop here, I can create much safer systems. Okay, so um, with that, I'm gonna kinda get ourselves wrapped up a little bit and then do a couple questions. Um, I want you to think about this, which is that, you know, uh, the, these, many of these examples, much more detailed, uh, are actually contained in the book Precision. Uh, we just translated this into Vietnamese, and I, I won't go through the whole story, but um, actually um, a couple weeks ago the prime minister of the country said uh, this is potentially a guidebook for the next step in the Vietnamese economy. That, that's how, I, I mean, I'm flattered, right? But the, the, the ideas that are contained in here uh, are really transformational for, for major businesses on a worldwide basis. And uh, so I'll, I'll touch a little bit about what that might mean for the, for the world itself. Um, and I'll say, you know, we, um, I, I have the advantage or the pleasure, privilege, of teaching at Stanford, and 
uh, I like to say, well, I get an opportunity to warp young minds. Uh, you may be surprised by this. I don't know. But not every kid wants to go build another social network or another dating website or another, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, good places to go eat, uh, mobile app or whatever. They actually want to do something meaningful. And I said, well, let me explain what meaningful might mean. Um, and I go, look, if you look at the global economy, the global economy is driven by developing economies. Developing economies are driven by growth in population. And at the end of the day, where is that happening? Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa. If you look, and I'm just going to just point at Africa for just a second. If you look at Africa, the third largest country in the world in the year 2040 is going to be Nigeria. It's going to be India. Well, you, you know, you guys are the number one. You're going to be India, then China, and then Nigeria. Now, most people, I mean, everybody's heard that India is big. Most people don't realize that Nigeria is going to be the third largest country in the world. 25% of the globe's population is going to be in Africa in the year 2040. So then I ask a question. I go, well, okay, uh, if you're a developing nation, developing economy, well, you know, do you uh, – you're going to construction, uh, agriculture, all these fundamental industries, uh, telecommunications. You know, well, if you're going to do telecommunications, would you choose the first world solution, uh, meaning put up a bunch of landlines, or would you skip ahead and just do 4G? Well, it's obvious you'd skip ahead and do 4G. Well, we have this enormous opportunity in front of ourselves where we can leapfrog these technologies. Let me just point at power for a second. If you look at it, um, it a first world solution to a power grid is, I'm going to build a large coal-fired plant with hierarchical distribution of AC power. And you go, in the modern era, why would you do that, right? Why wouldn't you just you know, put up solar where you could, wind where you could, small hydro where you could, right? And, and battery backup, and maybe even skip AC altogether, right? So could I not reinvent how I do power, how I do health care, right, how I do agriculture right, in a much more precise way by using all these technologies we have to bear, we have, and, and bring them to bear. So um, I, I'll end by saying... Um, you know, uh, unless we all move to Mars, and, and I know there are people working on the Move to Mars project, but unless we all move to Mars, we are going to have to operate on a planet much more precisely. And I believe the technologies that I've just outlined, the business models that may come to bear, will be part of how this happens. So if any of you students out there, young entrepreneurs out there, are interested in this. I mean, I think this is transformative from a business perspective, from a nation perspective, and from the world. So with that, I'll um, um, open up for some questions. I notice there's traffic going on here. So uh, let me see what I can see here. Okay, I'm seeing some. Uh, so what's the difference between artificial intelligence and IoT? Well, I, I'm going to say they're, you know, they're not, uh, they're not, they're overlapping. They're not the, the uh, two sides of a coin. So my point when I was talking is that the technology that you see today that are being used for let's call it speech recognition, just to point at it, uh, that are working so well in, some, let's call it serial echo, these sorts of things. Uh, I can bring these to bear because realize what speech recognition is doing is, in essence, it's looking at time series-based data, in this case, voice, right? Um, and so when I said wind turbines, you know, road gators, any of these machines um, are emitting tons of time series-based data. So... Uh, the, the operating belief is, uh, couldn't I take the technologies that are today being used for speech recognition, that 
kind of time series data and bring it over into this world and, for instance, recognize when failure may occur, predictive maintenance, so to speak, recognize when I'm, I could perform more optimally, right, and use those very same neural network, deep learning, et cetera, technologies uh, to, to apply to the world of things. Uh, um, I have a question. Smart cities are examples where IOP and IoT work together, transportation, healthcare, and physical security. Um, I, I, I agree. I, I, my only reason for trying to do this is I think as a, we've all been trained, the, the, the whole industry has been trained to talk about the what I call the Internet of People. So what is the, you know, what messages get sent to your cell phone, you know, what what um, forms are presented to your application. And I'm just making the point that things are not people. And so when you look at Smart City as an example, I mean, one question could be, okay, look at every city's got a ton of HVAC in it. In fact, there's a story in the new book in India about Voltus, and Voltus is a local company that actually one of the largest HVAC uh, machine manufacturers in the world uh, and what they're doing uh, to improve the quality, reliability, et cetera, of the HVAC machines using data, et cetera. So if you look at HVAC machines, there's actually a story in the book about a large Air Force base where you're looking at, you know, all the power uh, requirements of all the machines in those multiple buildings. And just put your mind, I'm trying to help you think about it, put your mind around from the point of view of the machine, not from the point of view of the person. That was really it. IOP applications will continue for quite some time, right? Um, IOT, oh, uh, sir, please comment on IOT software infrastructure for energy management and smart grid city projects in India. Um, so uh, my first comment, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what all the projects are going on in India. But I'll make a little bit more of a comment about smart grid and energy management. I already said there was actually a case in the book about uh, much more than energy management um, 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 using, quote, IoT technology. In the at an Air Force base called an Air Force Base. Uh, so you can read a little bit about that. But um, may I'll take this as an opportunity to make a comment. Remember I said um, there's a world of people who make machines, the world of people who um, who use machines. And and uh, I, I spent a, a little bit of time with the guys at Samsung uh, Smart Home. Uh, as I said, I don't spend a lot of time on the consumer side, but Smart Home... I, I was talking to him, I said, well, I can explain why smart home hasn't happened, right? Even though people have been working on this for like 20 years. And I said, here's, here's why. It, it, Samsung comes into my house and says, well, hey, make your microwave oven, your dishwasher, your refrigerators, your TV, everything Samsung, and let me show you how cool it could be. And I go, but, you know, I just bought my dishwasher, and I like my refrigerator, right? Now, think about this. This is the same thing that's going on in a hospital, in a farm, in a utility, which is that you have a diversity of machines that don't all come from one supplier, and oh, by the way, a diversity in time. So I've got old machines, new machines, middle-aged machines. Uh, I did a talk last year for Philip Morris. Uh, they're the remnants of the uh, of the. Uh, giant cigarette business uh, called Philip Morris. I think they're, even today, $36 billion on, on a global basis. Their youngest manufacturing plant is 20 years old. So now think about this. Whether it's a hospital, whether it's a utility, whether it's a farm, if you're dealing with a heterogeneity of machine and in time and supplier, the only business model that can attack this is a consultative one because I cannot repetitively do anything. These are all different. And so I think point one, if you're going to go into the space and think about this from a 
you know, hospital from a farm point of view, you must also think about it from a consulting point of view, which has very different business models to it. Whereas if I think about it from the standpoint of a wind turbine, uh, a set of solar panels, or just to stay in energy, from the machine's point of view, then I can be much more highly repetitive because this is a product-oriented approach. So I counsel people when they're starting to look at this problem, go spend time with the people who make machines, not the guys that use machines, because we're going to be able to make far faster progress with the guys that make machines. I'm looking through the questions. IoT. IoT means putting Internet in everything, right? I, maybe that's a broad comment. My, my mom, what I'd like you to think about, and all of you that are listening, because it's even for me, I didn't realize this, there are so many different kinds of machines across so many of these industries. I just spent time with, well, let's talk about healthcare for a second, the largest um, hospitals in, uh, in the L.A. area. Uh, they have... They have 67 different kinds of machines and nearly 700 of these machines. This is everything from blood analyzers, you know, different kinds of injection technologies, x-ray, MRI scanner, I mean, all these sorts of things, right? So once you become a, a student in any one of these areas, construction, I made the point, you know, one of the largest um, uh, construction rental companies has 4,000 different classes of construction equipment, right? And, and then once you appreciate that diversity and then realize that, well, is not the future of all these machines a software-defined future? And I think when you see it from that point of view, you go, oh, okay, now, what is the Internet of Things? It's those things being connected, collecting the data from them, learning from them, so that I can either optimize or maintain the performance, security, or availability of those machines. That's how I would want you to start to think about, quote, unquote, the Internet of Things, particularly for the enterprise slash business uh, world. What is cloud computing? Well, I'll leave that one. What is the essence of Internet of Things? What do we gain from connecting a bunch of things together? Okay, what, what do you get from connecting a bunch of things together? Well, this is where um, if I can connect, you know, every blood analyzer, we'll just do that for, for, as an example, then one of the things that I can do is using the data from all of that, I could, could for instance, be able, and, and I like to say, either maintain the availability or performance of these machines, meaning, oh, and people talk about predictive maintenance. Okay, I can predict that that machine's going to fail in two weeks, and boy, you should replace this part so that the blood analyzer is running 100% of the time. So that's talking about maintaining availability. Uh, maintaining performance may be, oh, I can always do, I don't know, make up the number, 30 blood tests per hour. Oh, well, you're about, you know, because of uh, settings that you made, because of choices that you made, you're only down to 20. So how do I maintain the performance of that machine, one, and use data to help me understand that? And then the other part of it is how do I optimize, how do I improve this? So the other day, getting a large population of machines, giving me lots of data, allows, and we have the technology to go after this, for me to be able to both uh, maintain or optimize or and optimize the performance, availability, and security of those machines. So that's why you want to be able to do that. Who are the market leaders in IoT? Uh, I mean, a consultancy. You know, at this stage, and let me just play around with this. There, there, there are big players involved. I already made the point about GE. I just came back from um, doing the executive summit at PTC, which is a Boston-based company that's been doing a lot of work in this space. A lot of the big consultancy houses are all starting up practices in the IoT area. I mean, and why? I mean, I go back to a comment I made very early. 
if, if you look at what the World Economic Forum said, two-thirds of the GDP will be affected by the Internet of Things. Well, that's like, that's huge numbers. So anybody can't, n nobody can ignore that in, in their approach. Now, I think right now people, it, we're still very early days, by the way. So if any of you are interested in the space, I go, it's a great time to jump in because this is still early days. Um, I'll take the last one, and then we're running over time. Somebody asked a question about security. Actually, amusingly enough, I just did a keynote speech this morning, a security software company, all about uh, security and, and the Internet of Things. Uh, just to make a point of it, we're probably at this, even at this stage, the bigger holes in the Internet are all not coming through PCs and laptops and cell phones, it's coming through HVACs and video cameras and centrifuges. So this is already the case. Now I think what's uniquely true right now is that we have an opportunity. Uh, you know, most of the machines out there are still fairly primitive by any computing standards. Uh, you know, they're running PLCs and you know microcontrollers and stuff like this. Uh, I already made the point that boy, for 50 bucks, I could put a big ass computer in there. Um, and now the question is, well, what would I do with that? And I, I think we have the opportunity to engineer security in from the beginning, which did not happen with you know phones and laptops, et cetera. I think by us thinking about that and going, boy, I should make sure that I can operate in a distributed way, uh, meaning I'm going to have lots of different you know blood analyzers to stay with that or gene sequencers or whatever. Uh, and I'm going to have to be able to engineer a solution that operates um, in a disconnected state because some of the times I'm not going to be near a 4G line when I'm driving my Tesla or whatever. Uh, so I'm going to operate distributed, disconnected, and I'll just make another point, which is uh, I, I can't use passwords at the end of the day. I mean, you cannot make a tractor change its password every 30 days and put an exclamation point in it. So I think this, is, this space is ripe for innovation uh, and because most of everything we have built up until now has been for the internet of people. People are not things, right? So why would it be true that IOP technology would work for the IOT? So uh, I don't know how we want to do moderation, but I, I uh, I think we're running up to the hour, or ran over the hour. I uh, hope this was interesting to all of you, got you thinking a little bit about uh, about the Internet of Things, gave you a little bit of a framework. Um, what are the things? How do you connect to them? What can you collect data? How, what can you learn from it? And finally, what would you do differently? And hopefully I touched on a bunch of different areas so that you have some idea in your head about what this might mean across all these industries. But if you're interested, uh, you know, become a student of this stuff. Uh, start digging in and looking at it because I made the point earlier, it's going to affect uh, a country uh, and, and it's going to affect the world. So with that, um, I appreciate uh, your time and attention. And uh, I'll, uh, I guess, end it here uh, unless a moderator is going to come online and, and end it for me. So with that, um, Good afternoon to all of you, and I'm, uh, it's nighttime for me, so uh, have a good day.